Ruth. One more time. Chapter 4, verse 13. This is El Finito. For uh, class, uh, I had to write um, outlines of most of the Old Testament and most of the New Testament. And I had to outline each book and come up with a conclusion. I had to come up with an introduction and a conclusion. And my conclusion, I want to read for you as my intro <laughs> for this evening. The conclusion that I wrote was, we see a glorious progression in the book of Ruth. It is the ever-increasing gifts that Boaz bestows on Ruth. It begins with her gleaning in Boaz's fields in 2 verse 3. It progresses to parched corn in 2 verse 14. It increases to handfuls of purpose in 2 verse 16. It becomes six measures of barley in 3 and verse 15. And it concludes with Ruth possessing all that Boaz possessed. It has been said that all Boaz had became Ruth's because Ruth became Boaz's. Does this not remind us that all we possess in Christ is ours because Christ possesses us? What a glorious truth. Let's read the, the text and offer a prayer. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Pharez. Pharez begat Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. May God add his blessing to the reading of even the genealogies. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this wonderful book of Ruth. We pray, Lord, that it would have been a blessing to have gone through this to each person that has been here for it. We pray, Lord, that you would encourage us as we look one last time at it. May you be honored and glorified in all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I trust that the Almighty God of the universe has brought truth to you from this brief treatment of Ruth that we have been considering. We deal tonight with the whole purpose of the book, the reason why the book is written. Its purpose is to show the grace of God in the line of David. The grace of God in the line of David. Uh, you'll remember, I think I shared this story with you guys before I was lifting weights last year and was starting to increase in poundage and getting to the point with my legs where I was pressing around a thousand pounds. And then all of a sudden my legs started going numb. Let me tell you what is not good when lifting weights. <laughs> numb legs. <laughs> it really helps to have control over your movement. Now, Why do I mention this? Every time we read genealogies, we tend to go numb. We read them and we're just like, Ram, Aminadab, Hezron, at what point do I really have to check in and care about what the Bible is saying here? But yet we see that this genealogy and the position that it is given in the text, that's the climax. 
That's the point of the whole text. The reason why this is written is so that we can get to this genealogy. Isn't that incredible? That, that, that an entire story is told just so that we can see how it lines up. So we have this wonderful story of this birth of a baby. We have the excitement. We have this, this unique naming of Obed. Uh, the, the name actually comes from the Hebrew word eveth, which means slave. And the family says, he is the slave of Naomi. He has been born for this purpose, to care for her. And so we see all of this and we're thinking, wow, now we're going to hear about Obed. And he's going to be this great man of God. And instead, we get smacked in the face with a genealogy. The one thing that we don't want when we come into our Bible reading. We're always thinking to ourselves, Lord, please, not another genealogy. But yet this is the conclusion. Now it's interesting to me, we have such a seemingly dissimilar ending from the book of Ruth, or from the rest of Ruth, but yet I want to, I want to give you our prepositional phrases. Do you remember we've been talking about these prepositional phrases? And a prepositional phrase is what? It's a directional phrase. It gives us a direction. So chapter 1, we said, was on the road. Chapter 2, we said, was in the field. Chapter 3, we said, was at the threshing floor. Chapter 4, verses 1 to 12, we said, was before the gate. Now, in chapter 4, verse 13 to 22, we're going to have this prepositional phrase, beyond the nursery, beyond the nursery. The main truth of Ruth is that the common events of life are used by Yahweh to contribute to the coming of his kingdom. Messiah is going to come. And he's going to come through this specific line. And we have this incredible story that all builds to this point. Jesus is coming. So, the first point for this evening. Faith must fix itself on the divine blessing. Faith must fix itself on the divine blessing. Chapter 1 and verse 6 and chapter 4 and verse 13 are the only two places in the book of Ruth where we actually see visibly Yahweh's hand at works, where, where, where the, the, the text actually declares it for us, where it actually says to us, Yahweh is working. Remember in chapter 1 and in verse 6, what does it say? It says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that Yahweh, L-O-R-D in capitals, the, the Tetragrammaton, had visited his people in giving them bread. So the Lord visits the people in giving them bread. And then in chapter 4 and in verse 13, so Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and when he went into, unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. So again, the Lord works to providentially provide for his people by ending the famine, and then he works to providentially provide for his people by providing this child. Now, we recognize that no person on this earth got here by accident. No person on this earth is merely a commingling of genetic material. And this is what the ladies at Bethlehem are acknowledging, that Yahweh is the giver of life. Now, remember, and I want to say this and stress this, I, if you read it in the, the devotional this week in preparation for this evening's message, then, then you're already aware of where I'm going. But I want you to remember that children are a gift of God, but they are not an obligation of God. Children are a gift from God, but they are not an obligation of God. God is not obligated to give anyone children. If in his providence he gives you six children, <laughs> you rejoice 
and you thank him and you bless him for it. But if in his providence, as is the case with both my sister and my wife's sister, he chooses to give you no children, you rejoice and you thank him for it. You see, we recognize that he and his sovereign purpose is beyond our understanding. We don't have to understand him. We don't have to understand why he chooses. I, we've all thought this. I'm sure you have thought this. I'm sure Eleanor has thought this. You stand in line at Walmart and you see a woman come through the line who has seven kids to seven different men and is living off of a welfare system. And you think to yourself, why on earth is the Lord allowing children to come in this way and yet a godly couple who love Jesus with all their heart don't have a child? And you think to yourself, it's not right. But listen, Listen, God's ways are not your ways. And God's plan and purposes are different. Do you understand this? There used to be in the Old Testament, what was the, what was the, the covenant or the, the requirement that God gave to Adam and Eve? Make babies. Why? So that life could go on. But in the New Testament, what's the covenant that he gives to us? Not make babies, but make disciples. That's what he tells us to do. You know that you can have children that are not your children. You understand this? You can have blood children that are related to you through the blood of Jesus Christ. That the Lord raises up and they will be more children to you. And, and dare I even say this, just like Naomi found that Ruth was better than seven sons. Sometimes you'll find that, that people in the family of God are better to you than any blood relation you could ever have. And so we recognize and we learn from the Lord that it is not for us to... <laughs> Let me give you a note. Remember the, uh, the, the verse in Timothy that talks about by in childbirth she shall be saved? Some people exegete this the wrong way. And they presume that a woman has to have a baby in order for her to be saved. But I would, I would agree with Alfred and his, uh, his Greek interpretation of this. I, it's, I like Alfred, so I agree with... Whenever Alfred talks about Greek, I almost always 100% listen to what Alfred has to say. He is phenomenal with his Greek definitions. And he explains it this way. He says that despite the curse of childbirth, because if any mama's had a baby, she knows the curse of childbirth, right? I can remember being in the room with number one, and we had that mentality. Do you know what that mentality is? We aren't going to have nothing. We aren't going to have any drugs. We're going to do this the old-fashioned, natural way. And it's going to be easy. Stacy's water broke. We're there. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. Finally, they say, well, we're going to have to speed this up. We're going to give you some Pitocin. Boy, howdy. Something happened then. You know, Stacy's, ah! <laughs> You know, and she's in misery, and I'm looking at her as her husband, and I'm thinking to myself, I love you, I care for you, and, and I'm leaning over her, and I'm crying, and I'm thinking, what can I do for her to help her? And I'm an ugly crier. I'm just, that's just how the Lord made me. It's not pleasant. And so I'm hanging over her, and I do one of those, <laughs> and I sucked her hair back my throat. I mean, like a big, <laughs> I had to, I'm like, oh, <laughs> And I am not good with hair. I mean, the, the, I, one hair gets in my mouth, and I'm about ready to have a heart attack. And I'm like pulling. <laughs> and so, so then I'm laughing <laughs> and gagging <laughs> and crying, and Stacy's going, ah! So I said, is there anything you can give her? They gave her this Benadryl cocktail mix, which all that did, that did nothing for the pain. It just made her sleepy. So she would fall asleep for three minutes, the contraction would come on and she'd wake up and she'd say, I'm not getting any rest. Now, I'm the husband. I'm sitting over there and I'm thinking to myself, at least you're getting three minutes of sleep in between these things. I'm not getting any rest. <laughs> the point is that childbirth is a curse. Every time a woman has a child, she experiences a part of the curse. And what the Greek is trying to explain to us there 
is just because God doesn't soften the blow in childbirth for the Christian doesn't mean that you should presume that you're not saved. That's what the Greek is trying to get across to us there. And it would seem to fit with what we see in Genesis chapter 3. It would be a reminder to women. But yet in this messianic sense, in the Old Testament, God often left us clinging in suspense as to the line of promise. And the line of promise, how many times does the line of promise hang on a barren womb? I mean, we, we see Abraham, and we're told that Abraham is supposed to be the father of many nations. And yet, there's Sarah. I mean, she's old as dirt. And she's got, you know, I mean, she, she's so dried up. We know there's no fruit left in the womb, and yet God creates life from Sarah. And then we see the daughter-in-laws the same way. Rachel is barren for a long time. And we see this throughout Scripture. This is a recurring motif. And even here, it seems like the line of promise is hanging in the balance. Will Messiah come? Will the Lord perform the promise that he has given? And when it seems like all hope is lost, Maclon and Kilion are dead and there's no one to raise up a child. Yet, here comes Boaz. And the barren womb of Ruth is touched. God wants the eye of faith to be continually fixed on him. He alone will bring about his purposes despite all of the evidence that seems to point to the contrary. Did you hear that? He alone will bring about his purposes despite the fact that everything else points to the contrary. Have you ever considered that in your life? God still provides for us. You know, I, I think to myself of how the Lord is blessing this church here at Grace. And all of the evidence should point to the contrary. We're a small church, small congregation, and yet the Lord has blessed us in ways we have such close fellowship. There is a sweet spirit. We're able to do things financially that absolutely blow my mind that a church can, of our size can do this. Why? Because God delights to run his program on faith. He delights. He delights for us to say, wow, this is beyond our recognition. We're not doing this. If, if you're thankful that you're a member of Grace Baptist Church, you should say to yourself, it's not because of me. It's not because of the pastor. It's not because of anything else other than God is blessing and the people are faithfully looking to him. So we rejoice in this. Now the writer of Ruth expects us to see Yahweh at work throughout the story, but yet in these two particular instances, he wants us to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Yahweh is working. God is the one that gave Ruth a baby. The whole thing would have been for naught if there would have been no baby. There would have been no raising up of the line. Now, Ruth and Naomi would have been provided for, but yet Naomi was intent that the line should raise up. It's not automatic that Ruth would have a baby, but yet Yahweh's grace gave her Obed. God's determination is to care for his people, and God's determination is to accomplish his kingdom work. And we must fix our faith on that. We must fix our faith on the character and nature of our God. He will accomplish his plans. He will. We look around at this world and we can't help but think to ourselves, we're in such dire straits and, and the world doesn't even recognize it. Everybody's so consumed about everything that could potentially happen to this world. They're so consumed the world's going to burn up before it's all said and done. Well, it will, but not the way that they're predicting. <laughs> and, and then, you know, the, 
I, I just said to somebody today, I can't remember, it might be one of you that's, that's here, and I, I said to them, I said, uh, I said, aren't you glad for this whole AI issue? I said, because now we don't have to wait 30, 40 years for the world to end by climate change. It's going to happen in two years because, you know, AI is going to take over everything. At least that's what they're telling us. But yet this is what we recognize, that no matter how the world mucks it up, God is still accomplishing his plan and his purposes. That's the story of Judges, that despite all of, of the filth that happened because men were doing things their own way, when we turn the page to Ruth, which is a Judges era story, we see God's hand is still quietly, imperceptibly at work. The world is going on, but Obed is born, and God's hand is still at work. Wow. Ruth is a lesson to us on seeing God work in even the seemingly simple ways. The second thing that I want to lay out to you this evening is in verses 14 to 17. Faith must marvel at the intensity of God's care. These points are not two second points this evening for, for you to be able to just click them into your memory, are they? Let me say it again. Faith must marvel at the intensity of God's care. Ruth is better than seven sons to Naomi. Naomi now has a redeemer. Who is Naomi's redeemer or Goel? It is Obed. It's not Boaz, it is Obed. Obed redeems Naomi's family name. But even more than that, he is a restorer of life and a nourisher of old age. Can you imagine it? All of this because Ruth is better than seven sons. Naomi had thought at the beginning of this book, when we first are, uh, were reading this, what, what was the word that Naomi had? Do you remember it? She said, I am empty. I have come back, I went out full, but I have come back empty. So call me Mara, which means bitterness. But now we see her at the end, and she's not empty anymore. She's full. Why? Because we are to look at this and marvel at the intensity of God's care. He cares for Naomi. He cares for, can, can we put it in real terms? He cares for an old woman in Nowheresville. Isn't that interesting? He cares for an old woman in Nowheresville. Should that not be an encouragement to us? That he does not leave the widows and the orphans to fend for themselves. Naomi had thought she was empty when she came home from Moab, but she didn't realize the treasure that she had in the person of Ruth. But the people will tell her that. Isn't it nice when some people say nice things about you to somebody else? Isn't that delightful? You know, sometimes we feel like we have to tell people about ourselves. Dr. Finnegan kept saying this week, if you want to find out how good somebody is, just ask them, you know. But yet it's interesting to me that it is, it is wonderful to be standing off to the side and hear somebody make a statement like this. It's a blessing to your heart. You don't work for this. Ruth was not doing this so that she could receive some sort of praise. But yet it is encouraging to still receive that praise. And she hears the, the scuttle in the street. Ruth is better to Naomi than seven sons. She is a treasure. And Yahweh uses Ruth to overwhelm Naomi with blessings. So I guess, you know, as an aside note, we could just throw this out here. Not every mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship has to be patterned after the world. Did you hear that? Not every mother-in-law, daughter-in-law relationship has to be patterned after the world. Stacy has to get ready because she could potentially have four daughter-in-laws. And I know the potential that can come with that. 
I mean, I could be just innocently sitting off to the side and have to hear my wife complaining about my daughter-in-law and then have my daughter-in-law come to me and complain to me about my wife, and I have to be sitting there in the midst of it, totally neutral, and saying, hey, boys, why don't we just go fishing? <laughs> but not everything has to be patterned after this world, right? We see Orpah goes home. But yet Ruth continues to care for her mother-in-law. This care for Naomi is incredible. It overwhelms her. The book is named Ruth, but isn't it interesting? You almost think to yourself, it should be named Naomi. Because that's where the attention keeps going. Every chapter turns to Naomi. In chapter 1, the people don't fuss over Ruth. They fuss over Naomi. In chapter 2, Ruth brings back to Naomi parched corn and an ephah of barley. In chapter three, 3, Naomi gets the last word on Ruth's report. In chapter 4, Ruth has the baby, but Naomi's blessed by the baby. The text is always bringing us back to Naomi. It's almost as if God is preoccupied with Naomi. His grace for her is a preoccupation in his mind. What is a preoccupation? Let me give you an example. If a hornet came into this room right now, we would experience preoccupation, right? It wouldn't matter what I said. When we, we've had bees fly into services before. We stop it because there ain't, we stop it and we send Jeff to kill the bee. <laughs> because there is not any way when there's a bee in the room that I can preach and people are going to listen to me. It just does not happen. I have learned that. <laughs> that is, you just give that up early on in the ministry. You stop and you kill the bee and you move on with life. <laughs> but that's preoccupation. You'll become preoccupied with what you see as the most important thing in your life. Now that's just a crude way of explaining how Yahweh is preoccupied with Naomi. I would like to tell you right now that Matthew tells us that Yahweh is equally preoccupied with each one of you. He is equally preoccupied with each one of you. You are on his mind. Have you ever thought about that? He does not forget you. You are on his mind. He cares for you. He loves you. God knows us intimately. God knows our wants and our desires. God knows our needs. And he is preoccupied with our care. Isn't that almost more than faith can imagine? Well, the third and final point. Faith, again, this is not a two-second one. Faith cannot guess what God will do through affliction. Faith cannot guess what God will do through affliction. And this is verses 18 to 22. This is the genealogy. Who would have guessed that the whole story would lead to a genealogy? Who would have guessed that this would be the climax? So we've got to ask ourselves, what is it telling us? It's not just thrown in here willy-nilly. It's telling us of the messianic line. Who could have possibly guessed that the genealogy of Jesus would have taken a detour into Moab? Or even that it would have found itself saved in a barley field. Obed is a part of the Davidic line, and David is the one that Yahweh tells will have the messianic line through. God tells David that death will not annul his covenant, sin will not destroy it, and time will not exhaust it. This is his covenant that he has made with David, and it finds its fulfillment in Jesus. Because... Death could not annul Jesus' life, and sin could not touch him, and time cannot destroy him. So through that line of kings, Jesus will come. So we find out that the book of Ruth is a story about Jesus. Buried here in the Old Testament, Ruth is a part of the kingdom story. Yes, Boaz fathered Obed, but what did it take to get there? Have you ever thought about this? Well, it took three graves in Moab. Of the three men 
that Naomi held to be the absolute dearest men in her life, her husband and her two sons. But it takes all of their deaths to get us to Obed. There is a trail of tears and tribulation on our way to the nursery. Who could have guessed that this would be the course that Messiah's line would take? I would hazard that Naomi most likely never perceived that her trials would lead to the coming of God's own son. We cannot uh, presume to guess how God will work. We all have trials befall us, and we have no concept of what beauty will come out of them. I'm reminded when my mother was diagnosed with cancer, And I'm reminded of thinking to myself, why on earth would God allow this to happen? You know, when you're early in your Christian walk, that's that's where you go to. That's the place that you go to. Uh, Even sometimes when you're farther along in your Christian walk, it's still the place that you go to. And, you know, we couldn't help but think to ourselves, why would this happen? But I can remember mom sitting She would sit in a chair and receive chemo and she'd receive it from 9 o'clock in the morning she would start and 5 o'clock in the afternoon is when she would be done. She would sit in that chair and be hooked up to a, a thing that would pump into her that whole time. And every person that sat in the chair next to her when they came by, she would say, do you know who Jesus is? Now they're getting the same treatment that she's getting. And she'd say to them, do you know who Jesus is? And one of those men that sat in that chair prayed and asked for the Lord to forgive him of his sins. And he died of his cancer. And mom said that if that's the reason why I got cancer, then it was worth it. This is the attitude that we have to have. We have no concept in our minds what trials and afflictions our paths will go through. But we equally have no concept of how God will use those trials and afflictions to write a story that is worth telling. That's the God that we serve. I can remember Chris Finnegan laying in the hospital. Every time she would lay in the hospital, every aide that would come in, every nurse that would come in, should take hand and should say, can I pray for you? She was sick. At one point we knew she was dying. But she would still take their hands and say, can I pray for you? Can I tell you about Jesus? The trials and afflictions lead to an incredible story. We don't know the end of our story yet. And I would encourage you this evening not to worry about the end of your story. You might not know where the pathway will lead and you might not know what suffering you must go through yet. But I would tell you this, we sing it. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. God wants to work in ways that are far beyond us. God can take the complicated circumstances of our life and bring things to pass that we could never dream of. That's our God. So let me ask you this evening, do you know him? Let me also ask you this, do you have circumstances that are difficult? This is yes, this is no. (laughs) I would assume all of us would be saying yes. And, And it's different for each person. Have you ever talked with a young person and they tell you what's difficult in their life and you think to yourself, you don't know. (laughs) You just wait. You know, you talk to these young boys here and you ask them what's difficult in their life. Oh, I I stove my finger at basketball camp. It's just so tough. And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, uh uh-huh. Just wait. Hang on. (laughs) It's only going to get more fun as you get older. (laughs) Someday that stove finger will come back to haunt you. (laughs) And you'll long for the days. How many of you have done this? You've longed for the days 
when the only thing you had to worry about was getting home on time. <laughs> All this past week, we would go down to Maranatha and would listen to Dr. Finnegan preach, and then he would hang around, and because we're old, <laughs> we would go home to sleep because we had to get the kids to basketball camp in the morning. So we would go home, we'd put the kids to bed, and Stacy and I would wait up for our 88-year-old teenager to get home. And he'd come trucking in. <laughs> hey, Pop. <laughs> and he'd say, hold on, I'm going to put my Bible down. And Stacy and her are thinking, oh, he wants to talk too. <laughs> it's 11 o'clock at night. We only see 11 once in the day. <laughs> and he'd come out and sit and talk. And what a blessing to sit and talk with him and fellowship with him. He's been a father in the faith to me for years. And he told me, he said, I'm so thankful that I could stay at your house. I said, I'm thankful that you could stay at my house. It's just a blessing for me. It's a blessing for me. We have pictures of him holding my kids when they were little babies. It's just a blessing for me. Uh, throughout our life, our children have got to see men and women of God come through our doors and sit and interact with them. And they have gotten to see people who genuinely love Jesus. And it's incredible for me. It's, it's been a blessing. But yet I, I think to myself, there was a time in my life then all I had to think about was getting home on time. And now there's so many other thoughts that are going every which direction. Try pastoring a church, right, Pastor Kay? You have somebody that says to you, this person's sick, and you've got that running through your mind. And somebody else says to you, this person's in sin, and you've got that running through your mind. But yet, you know what you've still got running through your mind? I've got three sermons that I've got to churn out this week. I had this moment this past Saturday where I was sitting there at home, not yesterday, but the last Saturday, and I was sitting there at home on my porch and I thought to myself, I used to complain about Walmart, but there are days that I'd just love to go back and just scan people <laughs> and then go home and not have to think about Walmart. <laughs> but yet the Lord is writing a story that I don't know the end of. And it's incredible to think about it. Even though our circumstances are difficult, I want to say to you this in closing. Trust in the sovereign God of this universe. I remember sitting in the hospital room with my grandmother. What a sweet woman she was. I mean, not all the time. <laughs> she could let you know things if she wanted to. But she loved Jesus. And I was sitting there in the the, the hospital room with her, and I said to her, Graham, I said, if this doesn't go the way we want it to go, I said, what do you want me to tell people at your funeral? And she said, tell them this, that Jesus is worth trusting in. And I tell you the same thing. Jesus is worth trusting in. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for this wonderful story of Ruth. We thank you for the fact that you can, you can write a story beyond our comprehension using details that we never would have dreamed of. We pray, Lord, that each person this evening would be encouraged by having studied this little book. And we pray, Lord, that the people would be able to say today that it has been good to be in the house of the Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. Dan?